quick show for you today. Um, our first performer is Jackson Brinsfield, who is facilitation manager of Science Museum Oklahoma. Now, this is totally cool. Jackson started out at the Science Museum Oklahoma when he was eight years old, taking those classes. He's not that much older than it now. Taking those classes. After that, he was a teen volunteer. After that, he was a floor facilitator. And finally, after all these years, he's finally getting benefits. Let's hear it for benefits. Come on up on stage, Jackson. This is good. And how old are you now, Jackson? I am 22 years old as of Thursday. Whoa! Very cool. And very first Aztec conference. This is awesome. This is totally cool. Anybody else here first time Aztec Con? Let's give a round of applause to the people who are here first time. This is awesome. Aztec is totally cool. Jackson, you are going to be doing a little something about? Will it float? Will it float? Yes. This All is his it. first time in Aztec. Let's hear a big round of applause for Jackson Brinsfield. Go for it, Jackson. All right. Now, welcome. Thank you all for coming out for the live demo hour. Now, like Eddie said, uh, I've been in museum for a long time, since I was eight years old. I'm kind of the product of all these programs that we put together, and uh, my museum has just yet to get rid of me. Um, and I've been here long enough that it's, they're probably not getting rid of me. Sorry, Sherry. Um, so they think, oh. That's never a good sign. Now, when I was putting together my demonstration for the live demo hour, I was thinking to myself, what did I do well as a teenager? Because I just wanted to bring it all back together. And I had a particular propensity for the pyrotechnics. Um, and when I brought that idea, they said, no, no fire. So I was like, what else, what else can I do? What else did I like to do? And I was obsessed with the idea of things floating and how size is it an indicator if something will float or not? So um, I started playing this game when I was a teenager, and I was volunteering, interacting with guests. I would play this game with the guests, and we called it, Will It Float? Now, uh, this can go one of two ways. Uh, you all can participate and scream along with me, Will It Float? Yes or no? Uh, or you can just stare at me, and I will stare right back at you. <laughs> And it'll be super awkward for everybody, but no more awkward than it is for me. So, I was thinking to myself when I was coming up with this activity, I was like, what is it that people think floats the most? And the first thing that I thought of was wood. So I've got two pieces of wood here. Um, we've got this piece and this piece. Now, sir, are these pieces of wood about the same size? Yeah. Yes, thank you, they look about the same size. Now, we'll start with this one. Do we think that this piece of wood will float, yes or no? Yeah. So one more time, will it float? Yes! Yes! It's a piece of wood, of course it floats. <laughs> this is another piece of wood. Do we think that this one will float? No! No? Make your face on. Shh. <laughs> will it float? No! How many for yes? Yes! How many for no? Float, it just immediately sinks. So we talk about this with kids when we talk about, you know, size and density don't really meet, they're not correlated together. Just because something, two things are the same size, this is not an indicator if it will float or not. These two pieces of wood are about the same size, but as you said, it is lignum vitae, which is much more dense than this piece of pine right here. In order to get about the same weight, we would need to stack three of them on top of each other, three pieces of pine, so that they would weigh about the same. Do these weigh about the same, sir? I'm just going to pick on you. They weigh similar, similar. Do these two, sorry, you're my volunteer. Do these two weigh about the same? Heavier. Much, much heavier. Now, I kept thinking to myself, if size is not really an indicator of some, if something will float or not, what about soda? I started looking around at things that I have uh, just laying around as a, as a teenager. I had soda everywhere, all the time. I think teenagers just live on soda. So I took my two sodas and I threw them in. Now, let's start with generic soda right here, not branded at all, right here, not sponsored. Now, do we think that this random cola will float? Will it float? No! No! Put that 
down on its side. No? No? Ah. All right, Diet Coke. Will it float? Yes. Yes? How many for yes? They're the same size. Ah! What? It is floating. So I, I came to the conclusion that maybe Maybe things, even though, again, same size, same material, they could be less dense or more dense than other things. So, again, I started thinking to myself, what else? What else? And I have my two bottles of water here. How important is air in something floating? So, I've got two identical water bottles. I'll come to you, sir. Are these two bottles of water identical? They seem to be identical. All right. Uh, one more. Sir? Sir, right here. Are these water bottles identical? Yeah. They seem to be identical. Good. Okay. So, if they are identical, they should both, what? Are they going to sink or float? Uh, float. Well, one seems to be floating and one seems to be very much sinking. But this one right here is staying afloat just at the top. And that's actually because these are not identical water bottles of water. I have filled this one all the way to the top. There is no air in this bottle, which means the plastic is just enough for it to sink. But there is a little bit of air in this one, which floats to the top, which is why the top of this water bottle tends to float. Ah, there we go. Can we all see it? Perfect. Shh. You can see it. You're like front and center. Now, I'm very sorry that I'm getting this stage very wet. Sorry to my future friends. Now, the last thing that I have, or actually second to last thing, I got thinking, well, what else could I sink and float? And one of my favorite things ever is this thing right here. This, this little doodad. It's a rock. So, would this rock sink or float? Whoa. It's a rock. It's a rock. Of course it's going to sink. It's a rock. rocks float. Very small rocks. Very small rocks. You're right. Very small rocks tend to float maybe. So that's why we threw out the really small rock and went with a really big rock. So if that really small rock just really sank straight to the bottom, what do we think about this big rock? Is this going to sink or float? Wait. We're not learning from our mistakes. We just said that that one would float and it sank right to the bottom. All right, let's try it. Will it float? Yes! All right, I've got real mixed feelings because now all of you are like, he's crazy. What is he going to do next? Will it float? Yes! Ah! You all did it. You all got it. Very congratulations to all of you. That, was, that did not come out right. Very congratulations to all of you. Now, the last thing that I have for you all, again, is dealing with size. Let me put this in my plastic bag again, not sponsored by anything. <laughs> now, I've got two different sizes of balls. I've got this one right here, which is a very small one. And then I've got this one right here, which is a very big one. Which one is going to sink or float? Is it the small one that's going to float? Or the big one that's going to float? You don't know. How many for the big bowling ball is going to float? How many think that this small one's going to float? How many of you are just staring at me, not wanting to answer? Thank you for your honesty. All right, so let's see here. The small one, will it float? No! No, not at all. Just not even a little at the beginning. All right. stuff out of here. I, for safety's sake, am going to use this tablecloth to wipe up the stage a little bit. Yeah, sorry about that. Actually, that's okay. We will uh, do that. Because this next guy is going to be doing a little bit of dancing. 
This time. next guy oh, is a David Gibson. David comes from the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. This is uh, very cool. And David, well, come on up here. Already up here already. That's okay. That's all right. David, four years ago, was a construction worker. Give us some muscles. We want to see that. Oh, yes. wait, I you know. Nice. <laughs> How many people think he looks like a construction worker? Or no, uh, that's yeah. like a uh, stereotype. But yeah, what, what he actually is, for the past four years, is a museum educator on nuclear physics. And the coolest part is how this happened. He was homeschooling his daughter and he was homeschooling his daughter on robotics when the people at the nuclear museum caught wind of what a good job he was doing, asked him to do a little bit of volunteering, and now he is on staff. This is totally cool. He is going to be doing something called the Nuclide Slide. And before we even start, what, what does that mean, Nuclide? Uh, nuclides, we're going to be talking about the chart of the nuclides, and those are the ice. I'll, I'll get my mic. Can my you guys mic. hear okay? Am I frightfully loud? I know, is that okay? okay. Can, um, can you guys uh, in the back make it a little bit louder? Thank you. You guys okay over there? You can hear me okay? okay. All right. Uh, the chart of the nuclides organizes the isotopes, and I don't want to give too much away, uh, but we're going to be talking about how they're organized on that chart, kind of like the periodic table. So the periodic table has all of the elements, but the nuclide chart sort of tells how things decay. Right. That Take decay. it away. Yes. All right. I won't, I won't give too much away right there. Um, hello, everybody. Awesome. Yes. I'm glad you guys are a little bit energetic. Uh, I'm David Gibson, like I said, from the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History. Uh, for those from the Bush area, that is nuclear. Yes. Can you guys say it with me? Nuclear. Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm standing up here and I am feeling a little bit unstable. Come on. There you go. Yeah, these are the jokes. They, they, it doesn't get any better. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm giving off energy. It's still happening here. Yes, yes. Uh, and that I am radioactive. Okay, that was the last for a little bit, I promise. Uh, I will be looking for some professional help. I will be needing a volunteer. Uh, I'm going to need a volunteer with a lot of energy. They will be up here uh, dancing with me. So I will need a volunteer. Is there anybody that would be interested in helping me out? You can nudge the person beside you. Right. And that's exactly what's happening. Yes. Look at this. All right, let's give this to you. Awesome. Yes. Uh, you may want to set your purse on that table there as you will be moving around just a little bit. Wonderful, we have a little bit of water here, but we'll, we'll stay on that side. Uh, and your name tag says Zoe, am I saying that correctly? That's Let me switch to where I, yeah, I'm used to talking on this side, I don't know why. Uh, uh, so, hello Zoe. Hi. I'm David. David, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, now, Zoe here is going to be an isotope. <coughs> now, I know that Zoe doesn't look like an isotope, she looks like a museum director. Totally. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm trying to help you out. Uh, where, where is it you're from, Zoe? Science Works, Hands-On Museum in Ashland, Oregon. Woo! Good, good, good. How long have you been the director of that museum out there? Um, for like, it's on camera. Uh, six months. Ah, there you go. Good, good. Uh, so Zoe here is going to be an isotope, which means that like me, she is kind of um, unbalanced. Okay. Uh, an isotope, like we were talking about earlier, it is the form of an element uh, that has the correct number of protons, which are positive, so you need to be positive for me, show me positive. Uh, but it has a different number of neutrons, okay, which are neutral, carry no charge. So like. uh, okay, you can stop. <laughs> Uh, but that, so that, that isotope, in an effort to become stable, is giving off energy. Okay, so now you've got to give off some energy. Woo! Good. Uh, in the form of radiation. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so uh, when when we're talking about these these isotopes and things like that, uh, there is. You got, how many guys have ever heard of the periodic table of the elements? 
Yeah, I, yeah, I've like got t-shirts, all those kind of things. Uh, what, what you may not know is that the periodic table has an intimidating big brother uh, called the chart of the nuclides. Okay? And so what happens is the chart of the nuclides, and you can help me out here, you can put your hand up just like this, there you go. Uh, the chart of the nuclides organizes those isotopes um, by two axes. We got protons. You are doing awesome. Yes. That's perfect. Yes, that's perfect. Uh, you've got protons and you've got neutrons. Good. So as you decrease the number of protons, and I move your hand up, decrease the number of protons, you move down the chart. As you decrease the number of neutrons, you move to the left. Does everybody see what she did there? Yeah, she moved to the right. Yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, I say, as you decrease the number of protons, you move to the left. Ah, no, no, no. I want you to actually move to the right because it's like you guys are looking at the chart. Ah, so you guys get, yes, now you see where we're going there. Yeah, so uh, as you decrease the number of protons, you move down the chart. As you decrease the number of neutrons, you move to the right. Uh, the, yeah, they're left. Yes, we got it, we got it, we got it. Okay, so you guys kind of understand there? We're going to imagine that there is a big chart of the nuclides on the floor here. This is where the <clears throat> dancing comes in. Won't be anything too crazy yet. Uh, but there's a big chart of the nuclides on the floor. As we lose a proton, we're going to take a step forward. Okay. Don't worry, we won't be flying into your lap there in a moment here. Um, as you lose a neutron, you're going to take a step to the left. Okay. So you guys got it? All right. Uh, so if an isotope is undergoing alpha decay, you have two protons, two neutrons, you can show me that one. Yeah, there you go. I'm not a pro. Oh, yeah, there you go. Or, or like an Instagram post. I like that one better. Yeah, she, yeah, she had it. I, I just, I really look like a crook. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you lose two protons, two neutrons. So you would take two steps forward, two protons, and then two neutrons. One, two. Okay, now, come on back over here. Give her a big hand, she's doing great so far. Uh, if we were to undergo, we have a, let's step forward just a little. <laughs> we don't want to step on that. That is a lot. Yes, um, all right. As you undergo beta decay, okay, one of your neutrons, from the neutron, there you go, uh, converts into a proton and an electron. Okay, so you get rid of the electron. Oh, I throw it over there. There's a bunch already. Uh, <laughs> you take in or you absorb that proton. Okay, so you would take a step back and a step to the left. Good. Okay, now as we're kind of moving around on this chart, as that isotope is moving around, it's transmuting into a new isotope. Okay, so it's actually changing into a new isotope. So we've got the alpha and the beta. Now I want you to help me out here. If you were to undergo all of the radioactive changes that would happen, okay, think about it with your feet here, uh, you would do what? Yeah, you'd, you'd be all over the place. Yeah, yeah, do a little, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, disco fever, you want to do disco? Yeah, there you go, yeah. You would end up moving your feet quite a bit. Now, come on over here. Uh, let's go ahead and give her a great big hand real quick. talk about a real isotope. It's just going to take a second. Uh, we're going to talk about uranium-238. Now, you brought the uranium, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably not. TSA has got all kinds of screens for that. Uh, yeah, so you did not bring the uranium. Well, uranium-238 okay, uh, decays by alpha, and it takes 4.5 billion years. Now, we're not going to sit here for 4.5 billion years. This is a science hour, not the science like, yeah, life of the universe. So, it decays by alpha which decays by beta to thor or to alpha to thorium-234, decays by beta to protractinium-234, decays by beta to uranium-234. You gonna remember all that? I got it. Me either. Okay, so, <laughs> if we were to go through the rest of that decay chain, which we're gonna do here in just a second, you'd end up with a staple lead 206 isotope. Okay? You guys don't have to remember all those. You don't have to remember them. I don't really remember them either. Okay. So what we're gonna need is, uh, we're gonna need some backup dancers. Does anybody wanna help us out? I need two backup dancers. Anybody help okay. me? Okay, you can, wait, not yet, not yet with the music, sorry, no. Let's yes, go. With the, that. Not quite yet with the music. Alpha. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, can I get a couple backup dancers? Somebody help me out. Way, way back there in the back, come on up, come on up, come on up. Come. Okay, you got it. Come on up. 
Give her a big hand, guys. All right, so as she's coming up, she's going to help me with the dancing. Uh, she's going to help me with the dancing. You guys out there are going to be the biggest fans of my new life. Do we get one more? Yeah, yeah, get up here. Get up here. Give her a big hand. All right, you guys can stand right here. Uh, come a little bit closer. Now, instead of doing it the way that we were doing it, moving around on the table there, uh, we're just going to do this Dance Dance Revolution style. <laughs> ah, there you go. So, uh, when you're moving, you're just going to move like this. Okay, you guys got it? All right. And you guys out in the audience, you're going to help us out. Uh, I want you guys to pretend like this is your favorite band and get your hands up. Everybody get your hands up. There you go. Get them up. Good, good, good. Uh, now, you guys are going to follow along with your hands what we're doing with our feet. Okay? So when you hear alpha, you're going to go like this. One, two, one, two. Good. You guys got it? And then when you hear beta, you're going to do like a no concert ever and go back. Okay? So beta is going to be one, two. All right. You guys got it? Okay. Dancers. So when we see alpha, let's practice one more time. Alpha. One, two, one, two. Good. And then beta, which is going to be one. Two. All right, you guys got it? Okay, I'm going to step it up just a little bit, and I've got some hats that are going to show the elements that I'm transmuting through, okay? So, we'll see if I can do this. <coughs> you don't have to wear the hats. Uh, yeah, uh, so these will symbolize uranium, thorium. Yeah, yeah, some of those elements as were, it was bad. I know. All right, so here we go. Are you ready? Go ahead and hit it with the music, and let's give it a shot. Get your hands okay, up for my new climb. Stand up. Let's go. Ready? Alpha. David, before we start, I said, how are you going to do nuclear energy, nuclear <laughs> physics, with crazy hats, but he did it. You know, we are here at um, the Tech in uh, San Jose. They have been fabulous hosting. How many people went last night to the party at the Tech? How many people thought it was fabulous? right here. Lauren, come on up here. This is Lauren Cage, who works at the Tech. Hello. So we want to Hello. thank Hello. you for uh, for doing that. And I'm going to zip over here so everybody can see what's right. going on. And uh, I am just curious, because last night I didn't see any demos. Do you do demos at all? I think we do not do demos here at the Tech Museum, but we do a oh. I know, I know, but we do do a lot of really, really amazing programs activities and lots of exhibits and they all have a great amount of storytelling which is why I love theater. Okay so what kind of activities do you do? Well have you ever imagined what it would be like if you could draw in 360 degrees? Create your own stage environment? You could do that in reboot reality. And actually how many people are planning on going tomorrow to the museum day? You are going to get a chance to be able to do all these things that Lauren is talking about. Yes, yes, yes. What else can you do there? Let's see. Well, have you ever made your own robot? Uh, last night I did. Oh, okay. Well, you're ahead of the curve, but you can make your own robot character in our social robots area. And I know you brought one thing along to I show. I did. You want to show us what it is? All right. So this is a makey makey. So I'm going to need your help with this, actually. Okay. So you're going to put on something for me. It's always dangerous to tell people. Oh, you're gonna be wearing something. All right, so go ahead and slip this on for me. Let's do that. All right, so this really, really tacky 80s vest that we put together is a Makey Makey vest. How many people here have heard of Makey Makeys before? Wow, okay. So this might be a little bit familiar to you. How about you, though? You played with Makey Makeys uh, before? This is my first time. All right, well. And we're gonna be in 
picture. We're going to be in a picture. <laughs> okay. All right. You're going to send me five copies. All right. All right. So I'm not going to boss. I'm not going to explain to everybody what a makey makey is. For those of you who don't know, we'll just have, we'll find out with him. So what I've done is I have plugged him in. We have our makey makey here kind of hanging. Now, I have a question for you. Yes. Oh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to hook up one more thing. So we're going to actually be hooking up. So I'm getting hooked up here on this trip in uh, in San Jose. And your computer just died. You're browsing as a guest. Okay, so now we're going to find out what like she's really made of. You know what I mean? This is like, uh, going to be good. We'll do this. There's no internet connection. Okay, whoa, this is the bummer. So we are going to let you see, because we've got some sound effects that will show you exactly what you're going to be able to do if you do that makey makey little thing. It, it's all right. It'll take too long to find. Well, what I was going to delight you all with. Well, we're going to show them. We're, we're going to do it. That's a new. We're going to. I'm going to make the noise. All right. So we're going to demonstrate what would be happening. The human internet. Here internet I am. Right the now. human hotspot right over here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's see what the different buttons. So you what probably noticed that there's some silver on him right now. So if this one would work correctly, if I would press on him, he'd be going. Boom! 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 Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and here we go. Ka-chang. Okay, let's play a little song. Let's come on right out in front of these guys. We don't even need this. And we are going to show you exactly what they're going to get a chance to do. Okay, so, you know what? If we're faking it, you guys have to help out. Let me go to that microphone a little bit. Let's play me. All right. Okay, wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. We're just talking. Okay, okay, here we go. Let's get that. Let's go. Okay, here we go. Boom! Yanka, 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 yanka. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. We have all this. That is what you guys have to look forward to if you go tomorrow to the uh, to see the Makey Makey stuff at the Tech. The Tech has been fabulous host. Let's give her a big round of applause one more time. All right. Well, that goes over there, and this comes over here, and I am going to go like this. Okay. This next uh, performer is going to use no electronics, no internet connection, no smartphones, no screens, no pads, no computers. She is going to be using eggs. Lauren Cahill, come up onto the stage. Lauren Cahill is a STEM agent today. Oh, I didn't do what? Rachel. Rachel Cahill. <laughs> okay, let me, I uh, uh, screwed that one up, all right. Okay, Rachel, oh, well, you've got the eggs. Okay, uh, that's not good. Rachel Cahill is a STEM educator at the Lancaster Science uh, Factory. I got that right. I'm going to read this right off of the card. A high school math and physics teacher and a naturalist, four years at the museum. Now, how many of you have ever done a bed of nails or seen a bed of nails? What you're going to see is even cooler. It's down over here, so for this one thing, some people might need to stand up and look around. It's the only way we're going to get a standing ovation. But Lauren, tell us about that <laughs> bed of eggs. It's all yours. Go for it. Or Rachel. Rachel. You we're know, going with it. We're just going to go with Rachel. So what are you going to call me when I call you uh, the wrong name? You'll find out. <laughs> time today. I have two victims, which I've selected out of the group just to save some time. So I'm going to bring up my two victims. If uh, Sarah Beth, coming out of Florida, will join me on stage, please. And then I also have Clint, coming out of Oklahoma. And when I say victims, these two weren't exactly told what they were going to do until after they volunteer. So, uh, they look like they're pretty strong individuals, so we're going to see if they can break a very fragile egg. So, if you two would take one hand and put it out in front of you, I need 
find your one finger on the bottom, one finger on the top, and we're going to see who is stronger. Okay? Can you two please squeeze as hard as you possibly can? They're not doing anything. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they're not that strong. But maybe I have some eggs that are really strong. Well, let me tell you. This egg is not hard boiled. Okay, all these eggs up here, 420 eggs are not boiled. They are all raw. So what we're going to do is we're going to put these to a structural test. It's a fantastic demonstration of structural integrity. We're also going to spread it out. So my first victim is uh, styling beautiful chicken socks on her feet. I did require her to take off her shoes. So David, please join me on stage. We are going to walk her on a sidewalk of eggs. So Sarah Beth, can you please go ahead and step onto the eggs? Please keep your feet centered just for gravity's sake. So I'm still wondering that myself. She's walking across the ice. We are especially if they are from overseas, or if you are a good demonstrator, especially from overseas, please come up to me afterwards and write live demonstration hour on your card so I can get in touch with you, just to get a, a, an idea. How many people would like to be in the live demonstration hour one of these days? A number of folks, that is good, that is good. Please come on up and let me know, and seriously, about the uh, uh, folks from overseas. 
One other announcement is tonight is stand-up science. This is totally cool. This is the third year in the row. The people from the International Center for Life in the United Kingdom have like, uh, started a new Aztec tradition. It is a, a comedy show, stand-up microphone, science, and it is going to be at 7.45, 7 o'clock the doors open, 7.45 tonight at the Loft, bar and bistro which is walking distance from here so uh, I hope that you guys will get a chance to come okay we are doing great here um, I was lucky enough this past year to work in the World Science Festival with Alan Alda it's the second year in a row that I did that what Alan Alda does is I uh, call the flame challenge and each year during the flame challenge there is some question that he has 11 year olds ask scientists and the scientists have to come up with the answer. Well this year's question was what is energy and so I put together a little bit a couple of experiments not so much about what is energy but how do you store energy and how does planet earth store energy and so that's what I wanted to uh, show you right now and I will uh, get going. Okay, I have here a generator. That's a uh, Jonah. This is the peep, so save it your right. Okay, I have a generator over here. When I'm cranking it, I can turn some of my mechanical energy into electrical energy, which lights up that uh, light. The problem is, is that as soon as I stop, the thing stops, the lights go out. And I wanted to know, is there a way that I can actually store my energy so I can use it later? Well, this is what I came up with. I didn't invent it. This is what I came up with for the demo, which is a flywheel. And I'm going to start cranking it up. Right now, the energy that I just put in is being stored as motion. Think about that. You know, you think about batteries and stuff, but you can store energy as motion, and that's sort of an abstract concept. How do you actually do that? But you can store it that way. How can I get that energy back to use it later? Well, I'll just push my generator next to the flywheel. And it lights right up. That is a totally abstract concept where you can take energy, store it as motion, and then get it back again. And a lot of times when I'm doing demos, I, I have some sort of thing I want to do. And this demo was about, could I take abstract concepts and make them very concrete? Well, the cool thing about this is that planet Earth does exactly the same thing, stores energy as motion. And here's how. When the energy of the sun heats up the ground, some parts of the ground heat up more than other parts of the ground. And when you have a hot spot on the ground, the air above that hot spot rises and other air, cooler air rushes in and you get a current, a wind current. What wind is, is actually the energy of the sun stored as motion. And in the exact same way that we were able to tap into the energy of motion with this over here, People have been tapping into the energy of the sun stored as wind motion for millions of uh, thousands of years. First with sails that push it, sailing ships, with windmills, and now with giant wind farms. So that way of storing energy is something that the Earth does. Well, it got me thinking, and I wanted to see if there were other ways that I could store energy. Can I get those chairs up onto the uh, stage? I've got a piece of wood, which I am going to break in a minute with this hammer. And because I'm going to do that, safety first. All right, thank you, gentlemen. There is the wood. Here is the hammer. I'll put it on. And now I'm just going to open my hand up, releasing that hammer. And it does not break. The hammer by itself does not have enough energy in order to break that wood. But if I add energy to it, I can break that wood very easily. The trick is that I needed to add energy. Well, I wanted to know, is there a way for me to store energy so I can use it later, just as I did a minute ago? And I'll show you how. Can I get that ladder, please? I 
am going to store energy by raising this hammer to a height. So there is the wood. I'm going to start it here. When I start climbing up this ladder, I'm actually putting energy into this hammer. You don't normally think of it that way, but this hammer has more energy in it. And you know, it was harder for me to walk up this ladder because of having that hammer in. The extra effort, the extra work that I had to put in to climb it because I had the ladder, that's exactly how much energy I just put into this hammer. And so now, if I don't miss, I'm just gonna open up my hand. And I have enough energy that I put in to that hammer to order to break that. How many people are following what I'm talking about over there? Well, the earth does the same thing. When the sun beats down on water and water evaporates, then evaporated water goes up into the sky and forms clouds. That's the sun's energy lifting droplets of water up and storing them at a height. And as long as those uh, droplets are up in the cloud, you have stored energy over there. When it rains, you can get that energy back because the rainwater uh, goes in the streams, the streams start going downhill uh, because of gravity, and you have water wheels or, 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 or hydroelectric turbines, and you're able to get that energy back. So that's the second way to do it. The third way that I came up with is in a lot of ways the most interesting to me. I have a beach ball, and uh, as long as it sits right over there, it does not have that much, um, it's not moving anywhere. If I want to get it to move, I have to add energy. I'll add energy right now, and it knocks the beach ball off. Can I get that back? Thank you, all right. I wanted to see, is there a way for me to store energy so I can knock that beach ball off? And this is what I came up with. It's just a pole, and I've got a bunch of ring magnets on it. They're in repel mode. This is just exactly like, you know, those, when you get the pencil with all those ring magnets in it. And this has different energy states. When it's like this, there's not that much energy in it. When I go and I push on these rings, and these are actually industrial strength, and I'm gonna hold it now, this is higher energy than before, and when I release it, I get back to that lower energy state over there. How many people can follow what I'm talking about, lower energy? But I want you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine magnetic fields, field lines right over here. When I push this like this, imagine those magnetic fields squeezing together. I'm actually storing energy in a field, and once again, I can get this energy out just by releasing it. Very impressive when it works. Okay, there we go. It is gone. But it works. Earth does the same exact thing, storing energy in fields, and it's called photosynthesis. And here's how it works. Instead of magnets, I want you to imagine atoms. Instead of magnetic fields, I want you to imagine electric fields, but really, electricity and magnetism are, are two sides of the same coin, so they're not that different. When you have uh, a plant taking energy of the sun and it takes water and carbon dioxide and turns it into sugars and oxygen and stores energy. That's sort of like the magical way to think about it. The way I like to think about it is this. When I have the water, H2O, and carbon dioxide, CO2, I've got lots of H molecules and C molecules and O molecules, and they get rearranged by those plants and get squeezed together into a giant sugar molecule in the same way that this gets squeezed together. All that that sugar molecule is, is the same atoms squeezed together so their field is holding more energy, and that energy will last forever. If you put that energy and make fruit out of it, as plants do, well, a week later you can eat that fruit, digest it, and release oxygen and get the energy. Or, if that is turned into wood, 
that wood can stay around for hundreds of years. You can release that energy by burning the wood, and that sugar molecule breaks down into the component carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and go off as water vapor and CO2. Or you can put energy in with photosynthesis and that can get petrified and turn into coal and that can stay millions of years in that energized state and then in modern times they burn that coal releasing that energy and releasing uh, uh, the CO2 with it. So, the point of all this is, is that there are different ways that you can store energy. One way is to store energy with motion, just like the wind. One way is to store energy with height, just like rain. One way is to store energy in electric and magnetic fields, just like photosynthesis. With all of these different ways that the Earth stores energy, why are we just burning stuff? Why is that the only way to get it back? This is sort of a reminder that with all those ways to store energy, we should really be focusing on all those other ways to tap into the energy and get it back. So, that's my little story about energy. I'll put that right over there. And we are in uh, great timing now because we have uh, one last gentleman, a good friend of mine, Paul Taylor, who will be coming up in just a second. Got a few guys can clear that stage. I also have to say that the crew and performers in the live demo hour do a fabulous job of moving stuff on and moving it off and switching microphones, it's awesome. Okay, Paul Taylor right over there. Paul is a good friend of mine. That's right. He is one of the best demonstrators in all of the world, in my opinion. If you've ever seen him, he does all these different demonstrations. He is awesome. But I didn't know this about Well, first of all, traveling science show and community outreach manager. How big is your business partner? Nice. At the Franklin Institute. He is a professional equity actor, so that's why he's so good on stage. He used to work at the Philadelphia Zoo, at the Camden Aquarium, now at the Franklin Institute, and for over 25 years, he figures that he has done multiple millions of kids have seen him. A million. A million, a million, that's right. And uh, we were talking, you know, we were thinking about uh, international affairs, etc., and wanting to protect Aztec. So Paul has come up with Paul's Missile Defense System. Yeah. So let's hear it for Paul Taylor. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, those of you who were here last year, you remember that I did uh, a rap about Newton. Oh. Yes, thank you. Three people. And you also remember that the sound didn't work in any so uh, wonderfully uh, oh, beatbox for me. <laughs> I'm sure you remember that. So, you know what, I, I get it. We're all feeling a little little tension. I think uh, these are very trying times for me personally. I think as a group we feel that. So I developed a short, quick little demonstration which will help us let off a little stab. A little steam, a little steam, a little steam. A little steam. So Paul's missile defense system, uh, it has two components. The first component is we need something to actually target. So we're going to target this hot air balloon, actually made by uh, this lady right here. It took her about five hours. So, uh, if the balloon is damaged, you'll certainly see her in tears crying over here, but that's okay. And of course, we need something to actually uh, launch. Oh, by the way, here's a little tip for you. Uh, I've been to several places where I could not use fire, one being here in the uh, in the hall, but this industrial uh, heat gun is actually hot enough to give us the rise that we're going to need to get a good altitude. We should be able to uh, actually touch the, uh, the ceiling with this. So we need something to actually launch it with. So here are going to be our missiles. I love these air rockets. They're great. By the way, little tip, little kids, whenever you pump the, pump the thing, Nice and high. <laughs> because I've discovered that it's really awkward to hear pumping for the Okay, so here's what's going to happen. Uh, well, let me demonstrate. Uh, we're going to launch this puppy. Here we go. You know, we all know Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Air pushing down is going to give us a push up. This doesn't fail. Here we go. In three, two, one. Make no sound 
Thanks, Laura. May I, may I thank you, Eddie? Quite deflated. So, uh, you know what? We're going we're gonna to up this. We need as many missiles as we can get. So, would you bring them out, please? So, we have about 60 missiles. We're going to scatter them about. Now, listen carefully. When you receive your missile, I want you to hold it clip down. If you're dumb, yeah, clip down. <laughs> I want you to keep the clip on it. We're not on clipping yet. I will give you the several commands. The first command will be Let's get on clip. When I say on clip, I need you to say ready. Let's practice that. On clip! Ready! Okay, to practice the those. Oh, would you mind? Alright, now since these have been in the clip for a while, we're going to need to, uh, for lack of a better word, we're going to need to sort of uh, fluff them. <laughs> The, the tip a little bit, the nozzle, if you will. And then I'm going to give you the command of watch. So we're going to get this hot air balloon going. We're going to get it up when it hits about 20 feet. I want each of you to aim your air rocket at the uh, at the hot air balloon. As we know, hot air is going to rise in the presence of cold air, and I think this is going to be great. All right, once again, not yet. We're going to unclip. You'll say ready. We're going to say, uh, let's say, uh, fluff. Kind of fluff it up. And then, uh, and by the way, please be careful. I hate to have any uh, premature launch. It's a really bad, it's a really bad thing. All right, here we go. Give me just a second here to get this going. All right. This actually works really well in places where you cannot use fire, which is far too many places. Okay, good. All right. Okay, everybody, remember, you don't be that one person, okay? Here we go. On clip! Hey. Some of you, okay, all right, all right, now make sure you've uh, sort of fluffed your nozzle. Okay, nozzle's fluffed, all right, here we go. I'm going to tell you when to launch. This is going to be epic, I think we're almost ready. Okay, remember, you're waiting for the word launch, and you can launch at will. Wait for it, wait for it. Okay, here we go, all right. Launch! <laughs>